Uh, the first week we learned about this young church plant where Paul had left a city in Philippi where he was put in jail for sharing the gospel and uh, where he was headed to from there to a city in Thessalonica. Strategically, we talked about why he went there as we looked at Acts chapter 17. And we looked at how he reasoned in the synagogue for several days, uh, several Sabbaths as a matter of fact, and uh, for how he shared the gospel with them and to where that young church plant started. And uh, then we found that Paul headed out of the city. He was forced out by opposition. And as he was forced out, he went to Corinth. And there was where he was writing this letter uh, back to the church in Thessalonica because his heart uh, cared deeply about them. Last week, we learned that in his letter in verses 2 through 10, he focused on their work and faith, their labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope. And we talked about he shared with them what he saw and observed in them, and he wanted to encourage them to continue uh, in that through the threat of opposition. This week, where we're headed is we're going to look in verses uh, 1 through 12 of chapter 2. We're going to see more about how Paul is going to share with them the authenticity of his faith. Uh, why he needs to do this is, is incredibly important because as he's away, of course, naturally what the people in Thessalonica who did not want the gospel message there are going to do is they are going to try to discredit his character and his integrity. And so we're going to learn much about what it means to be an authentic Christian from, of Christ and uh, what Paul's life looked like and what he writes to them and shares with them and how he encourages them uh, to press on. Why is this important for us? And I think this is important for us as a young church plant, 13 years old, as we continue to evaluate and look at the authenticity of our story, who are we to Sunset Beach, Horry County, Brunswick County, those in which God has placed us and called us to serve and to lead. And so I think there's many questions we can self-reflect as we study, as we think about, and as we examine our own lives and our own authentic Christian walk as we look at Paul's walk. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson said, You begin to understand from the moment you become a Christian that you are someone who has died to sin and has been raised to newness of life. You are somebody over whose life the dominion of the power of sin has been broken. You begin to learn to interpret your life in terms of what God says about you because you are united to Christ instead of interpreting the gospel in terms of where you are in your struggle. Ferguson is talking about our union with Christ, something incredibly important for us to grab hold of that Paul talked about that very first week. And as we learned a few Sundays ago, when we started in 1 Thessalonians, Paul began his letter highlighting this union as he wrote, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. Paul was reminding this young church that they were in union with God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of this, Ferguson says, we must learn to interpret our life in terms of what God says about us. Paul is encouraging the Thessalonian church to look at their situation in light of this reality and not of their sufferings and their trials they're experiencing. You see, I am not a failure as a, a parent. I'm not a failure as a father. I'm not a failure as a teen. I'm not a failure with this addiction or struggle that I have. Although at times we tend to define ourselves those way, don't we? We get caught into believing we are what the world says we are or what others says we are. But those of us who are believers in Christ, who have surrendered our life to Jesus Christ, those definitions don't belong to us anymore, do they? As teens look on social media, as adults compare themselves on social media, I am not that anymore. I am a believer in Christ. I am one of God's childs. I am a new creation. And we need to remind ourselves of these things because we are in fact, as believers in Christ, children of God. That is who He says we are. We are made in His image. And so we've got to grab hold of that truth of what that means, our union with Christ, as we walk and live in this world. Paul uses the expression, in Christ, in the Lord or in Him, over 160 times in his epistles. And this is such an incredible part of Paul's theology that Ferguson says the whole of Christian life is stamped with participation in 
in Christ. So how does Paul live out this truth that he is in Christ? That he is a new creation? Well, as Christians, we also need to ask ourselves often this same question. How do I live out this truth? How do I live out this truth that I am in Christ? That I am in union with Him? Well, let's examine this morning how Paul deals with the authenticity of his life in relation to this church in Thessalonica as we look at a few of the important character traits. If you would, open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm going to read uh, from verses 1-12. through 12. For you yourselves know, brothers, that are coming to you is not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses in God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that as we would study the authenticity of the life of Paul and how he imitated that to the believers in Thessalonica, I pray that we too would examine our own authentic Christian walk. I pray that you would speak to us individually as family units, Father God, and corporately as the church that you've called us to be here at River of Life Baptist Church. I pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit would do your work, that you would increase, and that, Father God, we would decrease as, Father God, we study your word, as we listen to your Holy Spirit, and as your Spirit speaks to us, I pray we would respond the way in which you've called us to respond. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A few of the things I want you to notice, uh, one, as we look at the Apostle Paul, is we're going to see uh, he goes the distance. In verses 1 and 2, notice that Paul is willing to go the distance. Verse 1 says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that are coming to you is not in vain. You know, according to John Stott, this passage reveals more about the heart, the soul, and the emotions of Paul than any of his other writings. Stott writes, no one is engaged in any form of pastoral ministry, ordained or lay, whether you're paid or not paid, uh, can fail to be touched and challenged by what Paul writes here. In Paul, we see a man who went the distance for and with the people that he was called to serve. The Thessalonians, they knew this to be true of Paul. And for you and I this morning, this is a challenge and a reminder for us to ask ourselves, do the people that I serve know this to be true of me? In verse 1, Paul's reminding this young church that they needed no one else to bear witness, for they themselves knew what had happened when they first came to Thessalonica and shared the gospel with them. You see, others had heard about it, but they knew. They knew. They knew firsthand because they saw them pour into their lives. For they had first-hand eyewitness and testimony of the love that Paul and Silvanus and Timothy shared with them. You see, Paul is prepping them for his defense against his accusers. 
You see, there's always out, people out there who want to discredit those who are preaching the gospel, right? They want to discredit first the message, the gospel, and they want to discredit the messengers, right? And so by calling them to witness, Paul is pointing out that all of the facts required to vindicate him were in fact facts of common knowledge. If they reflected back, they would know this was true. And so Paul adds, he says, their visit, it wasn't in vain. We saw this last Sunday when we looked at chapter 1, verse 9, in which uh, we saw that they turned from idols to serve the living and true God. In fact, that word went out, if you remember, to where? Macedonia and Achaia, and then it spread where? Everywhere. And I think about that, and we talked about that this past Wednesday and last Sunday, is imagine what they must have been doing, the fact that it got spread everywhere. People knew who these guys were. So much that everyone talked about it, talked about them. And as we saw in the first verse, they're coming to Thessalonica, it was fruitful. Next, in verse 2, we're going to see that although fruitful, what usually follows with that is opposition. Right? Satan doesn't like it when we're advancing ground for God's kingdom, does he? In verse 2, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. You see, in Philippi, Paul and Silas, they were badly treated. Acts 16 tells us about the physical suffering that they received. It included flogging, going to prison, and placing their feet in chains. They were verbally abused. They were insulted. And they are reminding the Thessalonian church that they had this firsthand knowledge of this taking place, and yet it didn't stop them from preaching with boldness, did it? In fact, it pushed them to even do more so. So where did this boldness and this confidence come from? Why would they do this? Did they just muster up enough strength? Did they look in the mirror and say, I can do this. I'm good enough. I got enough strength. Where did this strength to be this bold in the face of so much opposition come from? Remember how we started this morning. Their boldness and their confidence, it came from what? Their union with Christ in God the Father. You see, those of us who are believers in Christ, we are united in Christ with God our Father. Our strength is where? For they knew that the words they were proclaiming were God's words, they weren't their own, and they were deeply convicted of proclaiming this me uh, message no matter what the cost. And Paul knew that this message, it originated in God, for it was about God. It was God's message, and it invited people to God's way of salvation. So the opposition at Philippi, which Paul spoke about in the first part of this verse, it doesn't stop when they get into Thessalonica. For he continued to preach, it says, in spite of strong opposition. More literally, this means they were facing a very real battle. And Scripture, we're repeatedly reminded of this fight, the good fight. Fight this good fight of faith, right? Paul's battles, they were intense. And his preaching, it hadn't been easy. And so when you think through this, and if you're the reader reading this letter from them, how could you think and buy into the message that these accusers were trying to present? that they were simply doing it for what they could get out of it. Who would do that? Who would go through the great lengths that they did for selfish motives? So in the first two verses, we've seen in Paul, Silas, and Timothy, a desire to go the distance, to do whatever it takes to share the message. And we're reminded that this strength, this boldness, and this, in spite of all the opposition, is because of their union with Christ. As we move on, look with me at verses 3 and 5. They go hand in hand together. Notice they defend their motives. The motives, their accusers and opponents, they try to attack. And pay careful attention to how the accusers, they go after the message and the character of Paul and Silas and Timothy. And first, look with me at verse 3. And we're going to see, as we look at verse 3, the second thing we see about the authenticity of Paul 
is that they have a selfless love for others. Verse 3, For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. You see, the opposition was claiming that Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they were no better than the wandering preachers of the day who were just simply trying to get money from them. So the opponents, they levy three strong accusations against them. Remember, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they're in Corinth, so they're not there to do what? Defend themselves, right, against the accusations. Isn't that when people like to throw cheap shots at you? When you're not there to defend yourself? Been around situations of people like that? And so the opponents who want to get rid of the uh, Thessalonica of the gospel message, they know they're gone, so they use this as an opportunity to attack Paul, Silas, and Timothy's character, and knowing that they're not there to defend themselves. And we see this all around us today. The first accusation against Paul was that they were preaching from error. The fact that Paul persisted through hardship and suffering was proof enough that he was concerned for the truth, not for personal gain. You see, the second accusation they levy against him was that they were uh, more serious, was impure motives or uncleanness. They charged them with impure motives, kind of a level of impurity in what they were doing. The third accusation is they charged them that they were using trickery. You see, the wandering sophists, the preachers of the day who were extolling money from people and who were using the gospel message to make money, they did this to try to get money from people for their own personal gain. And so they were accusing them of being just like those people. But this wasn't so with Paul, and he didn't try to trick his hearers. In verse 5, Paul begins defending against these accusations. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, for God is witness. First, he deals with flattery. Paul denies that he and his companions had made flattery their method. The Greek term has rather the idea of using fair words as a means of gaining one's own end. Right? It's not you're just flattering them to tell them something good about them. It's you're trying to use words where you can benefit from it. You might tell them what they want to hear so it can benefit you. You know what I'm talking about? It's a matter of using kind of an insincerity as an instrument, a policy, as a means of a way to get or persuade somebody to do one's own will. Think about how many commercials we see on TV. What are they designed to do? To get you to want their product, right? So they're going to tell you what you want to hear, but does it promise? Most of the time, no, they don't, do they? What's their gain? Their gain is for their own financial gain, right? Flattery. We see this all the time. The second charge refuted that Paul refutes is he says, uh, we did not come with uh, insincerity or bad motives. Morris says the term mask, it denotes a special pretext that conceals the real motive, like in a sense they were being fake. And so it's used to putting forward something that's plausible that might be well uh, be true in itself, but that is not the real reason for doing whatever is referred to, like you really have a false motive behind what you're doing. So here Paul denies that evangelism had been simply a cover-up or an underlying mask or, or simply a reason for greed on their end, and for they had no selfish motives, he says, in their mission. And Paul's words that are warning to all his readers is that you've got to be rigorous, you've got to continually be exhaustive in your self-examination. You've got to be extremely thorough to making sure that your motives are pure. Now I want to stop there for a second. Psalm 139, 23 and 24, David cries out to God. And what's he say? Anybody know? Search my what? Come on, say it loud like you guys. Search my heart, O oh Lord. Right, Reveal to me any what? In a sense, anything that's impure. Do we need to do this often today? It's easy to get caught up being in the world, right? We live in this world. We're not of the world, but it's easy to be of the world, isn't it? It's very easy to let the world rub off on us. And so as Christians, it can be very easy to start letting what impure motives be reasons for why we do things, isn't it? And so David says, hey, Lord, search my heart, reveal. We have to constantly be doing this, Lord. Search my heart, reveal to me any impure thoughts, right? This is important for us. And so we see in the first two verses, Paul says the authentic Christian goes the distance. In verses 3 and 5, we saw that they were willing to have a selfless love for others that wants to have genuine motives for why they do what they do. And then next, in verses 4 and 6, 
we're going to see that they honored God. The authentic Christian always has a desire to honor God. The first accusation against Paul, it was that he was preaching from error. The fact that Paul persisted through hardship, that was proof enough. And as we move on in 4 and 6, and we look at the honoring God portion, look at verse 4 as he goes against each one of these accusations. He says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. And so he's going to take those three accusations that I mentioned earlier, preaching from error, impure motives, using trickery, He's going to say, no, on the contrary, despite all of those, what they said, complete opposite of all those accusations, he says here in verse 4. He's saying that his preaching didn't proceed from error, for it was entrusted to him from God. You see, Paul, he knew he was called by God. He knew his call. Anybody read Galatians 1, 11 through 18? Paul said in Galatians 1, 11 through 18, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul was deeply committed to this message because he knew who it came from. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the tradition of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, again, by his grace, nothing that Paul did, he knew it was by God's grace alone, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remain with him 15 days. You see, Paul knew that his message, the message he was preaching, the message he was sharing everywhere he went, came straight from God. He was deeply convinced of that. He knew his personal testimony. He was putting away Christians. He's on the road to Damascus. He gets knocked off his horse. And Christ says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see, he knew his story, his life, what it was like before Christ. He knew what it was like in his encounter with Christ. He knew what his life would be like after Christ. That message, Paul knew, was the message he wanted to share in every city, in every place he went with, every person he went to. That's a man deeply committed, who knows his call, and so he's refuting, no, this message isn't my message. This is God's message. And he's reminding them the message that they're going to preach in Thessalonica is God's message. Not yours, it's His. Second, Paul was not impure, for he had been approved by God. He knew God approved him. I love how Leon Morris explains the meaning of approved to test, he says in the New Testament, the verb is often used in the sense of approving. And since the gospel is a divine origin, no one may take it upon himself to proclaim it. You see, God chooses his messengers and he tests them before committing to the gospel to their trust. The verb in the present tense signify not only a past approval, but one that continues in the present. We stand to prove is the sense of it. It's out of this context that Paul and his companions habitually speak, continuously present. God continuously tests people's hearts. God searches out the whole of our inner self that nothing is hidden for God. May we always and may it always be said of us that God continually to test our hearts and we continually would be approved by God. May we not ruin that. Third, Paul wasn't a trickster for he aimed at pleasing God, not people. No other gospel. Not a trickster. Listen to this. Grab this. He says this in Galatians again, back to Galatians 1, 6 through 10. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, and so I now say again, 
If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And grab verse 10. This is incredibly powerful for us. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Well, how do I do this? How did Paul do this? Because of my union with Christ and God the Father. I have been entrusted with the gospel message, and I am continuously approved by God, and I am continuously tested by God. I am reminded of Philippians 1.6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of what? Christ Jesus. You see, I'm a work in progress. You're a work in progress. We are a work in progress. You see, God's not done with us yet. We're daily being sanctified in Christ. And so back to this Sinclair Ferguson quote from the introduction. For believers in Christ, we don't have to interpret our lives from our mistakes or failures. They don't define us, do they? But we let them. We go back into slavery and bondage into Egypt often, don't we? We let them. We are in union with Christ. We are new creations. We now interpret our lives in what God says about us. That's why it's so incredibly important for us to know what God says about us. We need that reminder constantly in us. Paul continues his defense in verse 6. He says, Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Paul is reinforcing their commitment to honor God, not people. He reminds them their motives were pure. Paul was sensitive to the accusation, Morris says, that he made money out of his converts, so he, he did not insist on his rights. He now reminds the Thessalonians that when he was with them, that he had refused to be a burden by taking money from them. So he worked hard and constantly, and he had been considerate to them. I'm reminded here of a phrase. They could have, but they didn't. Why didn't they? Instead, what did they do? In verses 7 to 12, it says they were vulnerable. They could have insisted, they could have demanded, but they didn't. They were vulnerable, in fact, the complete opposite. Verse 7, it says, We were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. We were gentle. When they preached in Thessalonica, the apostles, they spoke as plainly as possible. I'm reminded of what we learned a few Sundays ago in Acts 17 when he arrived to the synagogue. He reasoned with them. He didn't thump them like we said over the head. He reasoned with them. He was gentle with them. He explained. He kept proving the gospel to them. He was consistent. He kept showing up. Isn't that what lost people need from us? Verse 8, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel, but also our own self our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. And he says, so we loved you so much. We loved you so much. We loved you so much. He's telling them this. We loved you so much that we were delighted to impart the gospel of God to you and to share our lives with you in doing so as well. We didn't preach and then leave and never be around you. We shared the gospel with you, and we shared our lives with you. We shared our lives. Morris, he would add, he says, the verb used here is the imperfect. It's this continuous tense. It's their habitual style. It's this idea that as they would preach, they would continue to share their life and they would live with them. Paul made it clear that not only they gave a message, but they gave their lives. And at the end of this verse, Paul expresses his tender heart. He says, because you have become so dear to us. Isn't that what happens when we start sharing lives with one another, when we start becoming and sharing our testimonies with other people? We become close to them. You ever notice how that works? They become dear to you. You start caring about them in a way maybe you didn't care about them before. As you get to know people, you start loving them for who they are Right, Not the mistakes that maybe the world or we sometimes tend to define ourselves. You start loving them differently. I think that's the type of agape love they talked about in week one and what we talked about with the, or last week with the copos that labored in love. He's not trying to control them. He's, he's trying to simply give to them. He's trying to give them the love of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Do people need that today more than anything else. Why would Paul do this? 
Again, this isn't something he could do in his own strength. Remember, once again, back to the beginning, because of his union with Christ and God the Father. Remember, every bit of this, where is the strength coming from? Not from me mustering up my own strength, right? This is what living an authentic Christian life looks like. As we move on, Paul once again reminds them they're living witnesses. They're authentic Christ-like motives and character in which the accusers, opponents are trying to attack. They're living witnesses. In verse 9, it says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil we work night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim the gospel of God. They labored, they told the copos, it was a wearisome, intense type labor. They shared with them the love. They didn't want to be a burden. They worked day and night. Day and night, working with them, sharing the gospel with them, living lives with them because they didn't want to be a burden to them. Also, the gospel could be furthered. All because they would see genuine love of Christ. All because they would see authenticity. Remember, the false preachers were doing the complete opposite. They were trying to use them for their own gain. As a result, Paul, Silas, and Timothy didn't want this to be a stumbling block for the message of the gospel. And so the verse ends here. It says, they were simply passing on the message from God, the gospel of God. It was important. They always were deeply convicted. They knew the message wasn't theirs. It wasn't human origin. It was God's. Verse 10, it says, You are witnesses, and God also. How holy, righteous, and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. So you see three adverbs are used here. But notice at the very beginning, it says, You are witnesses. You saw firsthand. You know testimony. But they also plead with God. God knows the deeper things. Witnesses, sometimes they can see the outward things, but God knows our what? And he says, so God is a witness because God knows his heart, right? And so he, he pleads to both of those. You saw and God knows also. And he uses three words, holy, righteous, and blameless. Holy points to the character involved being set apart by God. Righteous to the conformity to a norm. For biblical writers, that norm is the law of God. And blameless means without cause for reproach. Paul does not mean that he had behaved in one way towards believers and another way towards non-believers. He simply reminded the Thessalonians that there was nothing to complain about in the way that he and his companions had conducted themselves. A truth that believers above all people would know. They lived what they preached. They were who they said they were. And the Thessalonians knew this to be true of them. Do they know this to be true of you? Do they know this to be true of us? Do the people around us know this to be true of us? Verse 11, For you know how, like a father with his children, Paul had been concerned with his own conduct and that of those who worked with him. Now he turns uh, to the conduct appropriate to the Thessalonians. He points it back to them now and he says in verse 12, We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Paul uses three verbs to, co uh, to convey the manner of their preaching, all of which together impress the urgency of this message. And I imagine being a Christian in this first century Thessalonica was not easy, right? We think it's not easy today, but imagine back then. Christ was just put on the cross. This is 20 years later. Imagine this is pretty difficult. And so they probably needed a lot of encouragement. The preachers have been mindful of the difficulties that confronted them, and so there is a clear note of tenderness and understanding of the difficulties that they were going through. But it was important that they also understood that the message was uncompromising. The preachers, they had urged, they had charged the Thessalon Thessalonian Christians to live lives worthy of God. Paul reminds us that when we become followers of Christ, that there is no less of a demand made of us. More literally, the expression means to walk worthily of God. With the metaphor of walking, it gives the idea of this steady progress. You see, there's nothing static about being a Christian, is there? You can't just sit back and ride the fence. You're always going somewhere in a direction, right? We're either going towards Him or we're going away from Him. But we're moving, make no mistake. All of the encouraging, the comforting, the urging were directed toward the aim of seeing that the Thessalonians would live lives worthy of God, or more literally, they would walk worthily of God all of their life. Isn't that our plea for us today? I pray that we continue to walk worthily of God. And Paul rapidly turns from contemplating what people should do for God to what God does for them. I love how he always points back to what he does for us. And so Morris says, God calls you 
the use of the present tense brings home the fact that God's call, it never ceases. Paul generally uses the past tense when he's referring to the call of God, and he may use the aorist to remind us of the once-for-all nature of the call or the perfect to point to the fact that those called remain in the position of called ones. You see, we have assurance of our faith. We are His. No one, Satan can't snatch, that, can't snatch us away from Him. And so here we see that God's call, it's always coming to us, and that it calls us to nothing less than being worthy of Him. In a sense, the kingdom is present here and now, for God is working out His purposes. There are those of us who have yielded ourselves to do His will, and maybe some of us at times we struggle to do this, but the sense of kingdom is also for futuristic, so His kingdom is to be accomplished here but it's also futuristic that's going to come one day when Christ returns. He's going to put all of His enemies under His feet. One day He's going to return, right? Paul holds out this glorious future as the incentive for the Thessalonians. He says, remember this, remember this, so live worthily now, because that day's coming. We've been saved by a wonderful God. They have been brought into His kingdom and they have a glorious future. So live here and now worthy of such a God. Seneca, the Stoic philosopher who was a contemporary of Paul, recommended that people seek out for moral direction. It says, he said, men sick who teach us by their lives, who tell us what we ought to do and then prove it by practice, who show us what we should avoid and then are never caught doing that which they have ordered us to avoid. This is precisely the approach of Paul to the resocialization of the Thessalonians in the Christian way of life. Are you who you say you are? Does your walk match your talk? These are questions we must ask ourselves often. As we come to a time of invitation and response, how do we respond to a message like this? Well, first... If you've never surrendered your life to Christ and you know Christ has been speaking to your heart, you respond to that free gift. If that's you and you're in here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, come talk to me about that. Come talk to me about that. Second, if you've never followed through a believer's baptism by immersion and you know God's been speaking to you, I know some, some have shared with me that God's been pressing that in our heart. If that's you, come talk to me about that. If there's someone here who recognized that maybe you haven't been where you need to be with a church family, you've been searching, you've been looking for a church family, but you know God's calling you, you need to be a part of a family where we can join and be a part of a church that's going to walk out and live out the truths presented in the gospel. And you know you don't want to be a spiritual orphan anymore, but you want to walk with Christ with a church family to hold you accountable in love. If that's you, respond that way. Maybe you just simply need to pray at your seat. Maybe you need to simply pray and ask God to forgive you in any ways in which maybe you have lost track of what it's all about. Because maybe your eyes have been on the world instead of God. However He's calling you to respond, I just pray that you would simply do that. Maybe it's come to the altar and pray. Whatever He's telling you to do, I pray you would do that. Men, I'm going to look at you guys in the room. You know, stats are so much higher when the fathers come to Christ. When the fathers live out the principles and the Christian truth, so much higher stats of the family coming to Christ. Men, you are the leaders imitating to your children of how we respond. And so I encourage you guys, men, lead your family in response, whether from your seat or however it may be. But you lead. Be who God's called you to be. I'm going to pray you respond as God's placed on your heart while the piano is playing. Father God, I pray that you are doing your work. I trust and I know that you are doing your work because you are who you say you are. And I pray that, Father God, people would be bold in making their declaration, their promise to you, Father God, by whatever it is that you've called them to respond. If it's coming to the altar, if it's coming to talk to me, if it's just kneeling at their chair, whatever it is, I pray they would respond as you placed on their heart. May we be a church, may we be a group of people that are faithful, Father God, to live out these truths. And so, Father God, over this next few minutes, as people respond, I pray they would do business with you, that we as a church would do business with you. And I pray, Father God, that we would be the church in our community that you've called us to be. It's in Jesus' name I pray.
Amen. Respond as God's placed on your heart. I'm up here if anyone needs to talk.